Uh, thanks for your patience in staying this long. I'm really impressed that um, you've, you've, uh, oh, oh, you've stuck it out this long. And I'm, I'm really, uh, uh, it's re really a privilege to um, have been part of this incredible lineup. Um, my talk is going to be uh, very different from the others we've heard. I'm going to be, um, it's going to be a very philosophical talk and actually it will have some logic in it. So I'm really trying to uh, punish you for having stayed to the very end. Um, I originally, originally this session was planned as a part of the APA, the American Philosophical Association um, meeting in 2020, but that was canceled. So it was reconfigured as um, as a part of this meeting. And uh, so I had intended this to present this to a very different um, audience, but I hope at least some of you will get something out of this. Um, I will just get into it now. Um, I want to focus on, I want to demonstrate something. I want to demonstrate that some research on machine consciousness can actually help motivate solutions to philosophical problems concerning consciousness. And in, more specifically, or in particular, I want to most of what I'm going to say will be giving a novel reply to that old chestnut, Jackson's knowledge argument against physicalism. Um, I hope to be able to do, I guess I have half an hour, so I hope to be able to do all of this before uh, my time's up at 8.20. Um, but uh, what I want to do is give that reply, but also um, make it, it might seem implausible, uh, to some of you. And so I'm going to use some um, independently derived, independently motivated work in machine consciousness to try to make that solution more plausible. So showing how work in machine consciousness can actually assist in um, making certain philosophical solutions seem more plausible. Okay. So I'm going to recap very quickly Jackson's knowledge argument. I hope it probably won't make too much sense to any of you who haven't heard it before. <laughs> um, and those of you who have heard it before might roll your eyes at having to hear it again, but nevertheless, just to um, uh, make sure we're all on the same page. Jackson um, argued against physicalism and he defined physicalism as the claim that all information is physical information. So I'm going to be arguing against that. I'm going to be showing that he doesn't have a good argument for, uh, against, for against physicalism. I'm going to be showing he doesn't have a good argument against physicalism. And But the uh, what was his argument? Well, the centerpiece is a thought experiment that you might have heard about involving Mary, who is a, let's say, color scientist, vision scientist. Um, if, if she's lucky, maybe she could aspire to be someone like Kevin O'Regan. But that's the point, is that she is studying the uh, everything there is to study about uh, the brain and uh, the visual system, but she lives in a black and white environment. She's always lived in that environment, say from birth. So she has never, supposedly, she's never, you know, by, by hypothesis, she has never had the experience of seeing color, in particular, never had the experience of seeing red, let's say. Now, Jackson asks you to suppose that she has all the physical facts. So she's got as much physical information as, well, she's got all the physical facts. Um, and uh, he thinks that if Mary ever did uh, leave her black and white room and ex experience seeing red for the first time, it's obvious, he says, that she would acquire new information. She would acquire new knowledge. In particular, she would acquire the knowledge of what it's like to see red. But by supposition, she already had all physical knowledge. So the knowledge that she acquires when she sees red for the first time must be um, non-physical knowledge. Therefore, there is uh, information that's non-physical. Therefore, physicalism, as Jackson defines it, is false. OK, so I'm giving another reply. Do we really need another reply to this argument? Um, there are lots and lots of replies to the knowledge argument. Most of them proceed by rejecting T3. That is, they claim that um, Mary does not acquire any new information, any new knowledge upon seeing red for the first time. Uh, some, some ways that people have tried to establish that is by saying, well, no, actually what she acquires is a new ability. I'm not gonna go into these uh, other replies. Uh, another idea is that she, doesn't acquire new information or new knowledge. She actually acquires a new guise or a new way of 
of, of a new mode of presentation of previously known facts. So that doesn't, um, so it's not inconsistent with uh, physicalism that she acquires a new way of understanding a physical fact um, or a new way, a new mode of presentation of a physical fact. Um, Dennett uh, is an example of someone who says, look, all bets are off. This is such a bizarre thought experiment. We can't, we have, you know, if you think you know what it's like to be Mary and what kind of knowledge she's going to acquire or not, or whether or not she's going to acquire when, knowledge when she sees red for the first time, you uh, are braver than, um, than he is or than I am. Um, we really can't imagine what it would be like to be such a physically omniscient uh, creature. So do you really want to claim that, you know, rest your uh, metaphysics on such um, a, 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 a bizarre uh, situation? Um, but the problem is with all these replies is that there are counter replies. They can be disputed and they aren't, they don't have a, a kind of logical ironclad uh, knockdown nature to them. So what I want to do is offer, um, I want to grant, I, I want to re reply to Jackson and refute his argument by actually giving him this premise T3 that's highly controversial and say, okay, Mary does acquire some new knowledge um, when she sees red for the first time. But what I want to do instead is show that another premise, the other premise uh, of the argument, um, T2, the one that supposed that Mary has all the physical information, I wanna show that that's not just impractical or unlikely or hard to imagine or involves infinity or something like that. I actually wanna show that it's logically impossible. It's not just physically impossible as some people have argued. It's not just, um, that it's impractical. It's actually logically impossible. And so there's the, the thought experiment can do no work at all. You might think that thought experiments that have physically impossible, phys physically impossible premises might still do some conceptual work. I wanna say, no, this argument can do no conceptual work because it actually is a contradiction to suppose that Mary knows all physical uh, information. That's the first step on so I'm going to refute the knowledge argument. That's not my main target here. What I want to do, it turns out that you can modify the knowledge argument to handle my objection. And that's really what I want to achieve here. So I wanted to refute what I call the revised knowledge argument that Jackson's ever published. I, I'm, I'm putting it forward um, myself as a kind of uh, charitable reading, well, some reading of what Jackson could have done um, or what he could do in the face of my objection. And it's the reply to that argument, the refutation of that improved knowledge argument that I think reveals something about um, the nature of uh, consciousness, nature of qualia, perhaps that can, can be related to work in machine consciousness and machine consciousness can motivate the refutation of that strengthened argument. So that's um, why I'm doing this. That's why there's value to making another reply. I mean, if you think about it, uh, most, I think most people would agree that the prospects for machine consciousness depend on the truth of physicalism of some sort or other. Now that might not be the case, but that, that that kind of, I think can get a lot of you into understanding why, why um, rejecting a major argument for physicalism might have something uh, to do with um, machine consciousness, but um, I, I'll be able to make the connection more tight than that, hopefully. All right, so let's get into this um, uh, refutation of the basic knowledge argument, the knowledge argument that I just outlined before. Um, what I have to do to show you how that premise T2 is, is logically impossible is I have to introduce you to the concept of an epistemic blind spot. An epistemic blind spot for a subject, let's say S, is a piece of information or knowledge that is def it's true and it's knowable. It's not the kind of thing that can't be known by anybody, but for which it would be a contradiction to suppose that S knows it. So it might be a surprise to you that these such blind spots exist. Some of you, um, it might not be a surprise, but um, uh, it dates back to at least um, G.E. Moore, who played around with these things. He didn't call them epistemic blind spots. Sorensen invented that term, but um, let me give you an example. Um, suppose it's raining. Then this sentence or proposition is an epistemic blind spot for Mary. What's the sentence? It, B, it's raining, but Mary doesn't know it. Now that's a sentence which is true. Well, let me go the other way around. That's an epistemic blind spot for Mary. Why? Because it meets these three conditions. Let's start with uh, 
the last one I mentioned, the one I mentioned is number one here, B cannot be known by Mary, because if you suppose that she knows that, you get a contradiction. Why? Because if she knows it's raining, but Mary doesn't know it, then presumably she knows each of those uh, conjuncts. She knows that it's raining, and she knows that Mary doesn't know that it's raining, but that's a contradiction because Mary does know that it's raining by supposition. Uh, so to suppose that Mary knows B is a contradiction. This is well known. This is nothing new to my argument, right? I mean, something I'm using. So um, B cannot be known by Mary. Uh, but B is true because uh, it is raining. And since, uh, and, and Mary doesn't know it. Um, because if you uh, suppose that Mary did know it was raining, then um, you would get a contradiction. Um, so uh, B is, and furthermore, B is knowable, for instance, by you right now, because of this, uh, because um, I took you through the steps of uh, saying, well, suppose it's raining. Well, now we can conclude that Mary doesn't know it, and therefore um, you know this. So it's an example of something which is, it's not weird in the sense that no one could know it, it's just a particular, because it mentions Mary and mentions her knowledge, it prevents her from knowing it. It's a self-referential um, singularity for her. It's a blind spot for her, but only for her because it only mentions her. Now, what I want to do is um, make this step to show that uh, because of epistemic blind spots, this premise T2 is, is uh, impossible. It cannot, it cannot be true. Some things to note about that blind spot B, the um, it's raining part is completely arbitrary. We can substitute any knowable fact uh, into and create a, another uh, blind spot for Mary. So we can create an unbounded number of blind spots for Mary. There are an unbounded number of physical facts that Mary cannot know or facts at least that, that Mary cannot know. And then I want to point out that B is a physical fact it's about raining and it's about whether Mary knows or doesn't know that physical fact. Now, you might dispute that, but Jackson has to agree with me that B is a physical fact because if he thought that a fact were rendered non-physical just because it mentions a person's knowledge, then he wouldn't need to have given his um, knowledge argument in general. He'd just be able to say, of course there are non-physical facts. Look at this fact, um, Mary knows that, that Mary doesn't know it's raining. If, if, it's, if, if all that it takes is something to mention a state of knowledge of someone, is, uh, if, that, if it only takes that, it being about someone's state of knowledge to render it non-physical, then uh, we don't need the knowledge argument. So Jackson obviously didn't think that that was sufficient to show that something was non-physical. So um, he has to agree with this, that B is a physical fact. So we have an unbounded number of physical facts that Mary cannot know an unbounded number of physical facts that Mary cannot know. And thus, supposing that Mary has all the physical information, that she knows all the physical facts, is an outright logical impossibility, okay? So it's rather cheap, but I get there. <laughs> it's nevertheless the case that, as stated, the knowledge argument is unsound. It, it, it makes an assumption that um, is false, and therefore it cannot provide rational grounds for its conclusion. Um, Okay, so that's a bit cheap. One might think that you know, there might be a way for Jackson to patch that up and, and, and create a revised version of his argument that avoids my, 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 my point here. And yes, that's right, but it's not going to help ultimately. So let me, let me take you through this. So let's make this quick patch to T2 and say, oh, you know, roll our eyes at Ron. Okay, yeah, okay. She doesn't know all the physical facts because there are these epistemic blind spots, but let's just, put, let's just build that into our T2 make T2 prime and say, suppose Mary has all the physical information that it's possible for her to have. She knows all the physical facts that it's possible for her to know. Now, can we get on with the uh, knowledge argument, please? So yeah, T2 doesn't make that mistake. It isn't uh, a, a logical impossibility for Mary ha to have all the physical information that it's possible for her to have, right? Um, so the revised knowledge argument uses this premise T2 prime and it goes ahead as before. Um, but we can re the revised knowledge argument fails as well. Why? Well, because when you remove that, uh, when you replace T2 with T2 prime, um, 
it ends up rendering T3 false. What was T3? T3 is the claim that when Mary leaves the room and sees red for the first time, experiences seeing red for the first time, she learns something new. Why, and, and that it's obvious that, that, uh, that this will happen. Why is that, why is, this, why is it the case that T3 is now false? It's no longer obvious that she'll learn something new. Well, because um, under T2 prime, when you have T2 prime, we can now demonstrate that there are physical facts that Mary does not know before she experiences seeing red for the first time, but which she can come to know once she does experience seeing red for the first time. So now that there's a, a set of uh, physical facts that, it, that, uh, were, that we're not claiming she has before she leaves the black and white room, it's now possible, there's a little logical space now to, to show that maybe, maybe one of those facts that she couldn't know before, maybe now she can know one of those physical facts after she leaves the room. And that indeed is the case. One can demonstrate that. And that's what I do demonstrate. To demonstrate that. So the possibility of such facts, uh, these physical facts, which she didn't know before, but she left the room, but physical, but, but which she does know after she leaves the room, that's a result of T2 prime no longer supposing that Mary has all physical information, but only some subset out of it. So the key insight is this, that what counts as an epistemic blind spot for a subject can change from context to context. So it can be the case that something is forbidden for Mary to know, logically impossible for Mary to know before she leaves the room, but it is logical possi logically possible for her to know it after she leaves the room. And one of those physical facts can constitute the knowledge that Mary comes to know, and therefore we render T3 false. We, it's not obvious that she can't learn, that there's no, that there's no physical fact, um, that it's not obvious that she must acquire some new knowledge um, that's um, non-physical before she leaves the room. I mean, once she leaves the room. So that depends on the key insight, as I said before, that what counts as an epistemic blind spot for a subject can, can change from context to context. What's, how do I demonstrate this key insight? Well, we can construct such an, an, a fact for Mary and, and, sh and observe the fact that it's impossible for her to know it before she leaves the room and is possible for her to know it after she leaves the room. So let P be the conjunction of physical facts having to do with the processing of red light by the eye. And let RM be this funny proposition, this funny self-referential proposition. P and if Mary has not seen red, Mary does not know RM, where RM is this very proposition. Now this proposition, RM, I claim, meets this condition. It's an epistemic blind spot for Mary if she has not seen red, but it's not an epistemic blind spot for Mary if she has not seen, if she has seen red. So it's available to be the kind of fact that she learns when she leaves and when she sees red for the first time. Now, I don't just claim that, I have an argument. It's pretty, you know, it might be heavy duty logic for this uh, time of the, uh, the day. Well, I, well, after this many hours uh, following talks, but I'll just go through it. If you want to go through it more carefully, you can um, see my paper. So I have two things to show. I have to show that it's an epistemic blind spot if she hasn't seen red and it's not an epistemic blind spot. Um, that is, it's available for her to know if she, has, if she has seen red. So here's the first part. What's, how do I show that it's, a, it's an epistemic blind spot for her if she hasn't seen red? So let's assume she hasn't seen red. What follows? Well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna suppose that she does know RM because that's the opposite of what I want to show. I'm going to show the contradiction follows from supposing that she knows RM. So I'm going to show that it's impossible for her to know RM if she hasn't seen red, because a contradiction follows from supposing that she does know RM. All right, how does it go? So suppose she knows RM. Well, that means she knows the second part of RM. Our second part of RM is this uh, uh, conditional, if Mary has not seen red, Mary does not know RM. Well. If Mary knows that, then she knows that she does not know RM because she knows an if then statement and she knows the uh, antecedent of the um, uh, if then statement. So therefore she knows the consequent of the if then statement. I'm assuming that knowledge distributes over 
uh, implication. So Mary knows that she does not know RM, but it follows from the fact that knowledge implies truth that Mary does not know RM. But we suppose that Mary does know RM, so we have a contradiction. We concluded from the supposition that Mary does know RM that Mary does not know RM. So it's a contradiction to suppose that she does not know that she does know RM. Therefore, we can conclude six that she does not know RM. To suppose otherwise is a contradiction. So if Mary has not seen red, we can conclude, well, sorry, so we can conclude seven. If Mary has not seen red, Mary does not know RM. But note that if Mary has not seen red, that, that fact seven, we can derive it as truth, but Mary cannot know it. But it is true and it is knowable, for instance, by us. So if that's if seven is true, then just conjoining P onto the beginning, beginning of it is also true because we're assuming that P or true is true, consists of true facts about the visual system, right? So we have uh, the truth of RM. P, and if Mary has not seen red, Mary does not know RM. So um, that means this RM is true, it's knowable, for instance, by us, but um, Mary can't know it if she's not seen red. So that's the first part. It's one of these facts that's excluded from her. She can't know it before she leaves the room. Is it a fact that she can know when she does leave the room? Yes. Recall that this is what we're talking about. RM is this conjunction of P, some phys physiological facts, physical facts about Mary's visual system, plus this conditional. If Mary is not seen red, Mary does not know RM. What I want to do is show that, uh, well, notice that what happens to this, uh, this proposition RM once she has had the experience of seeing red. Once she sees red, RM is still true. Why? Well, because P is still true. And the second conjunct, this conditional, is now trivially true. It has this false antecedent. If then statements with a false antecedent are true. So RM is still true. And it's still knowable by you, for instance, because you know P is true and you know that um, the second half of the conditional is, is true. Um, but it's no longer an epistemic blind spot for Mary. Why? Well, because the, uh, the upshot of the falseness of the antecedent of that uh, second conjunct, if Mary has not seen red, that's false in the situation we're talking about. Mary has seen red in the situation we're talking about, means that that second conjunct can be true without um, requiring the truth of the concept of that uh, Mary does not know RM. So we can have this thing be true just by virtue of the falsity of the, uh, of if Mary has not seen red. So we don't require Mary does not know RM to be true, unlike the previous case. So there's no, no contradiction supposing that Mary knows RM, so it's not an epistemic blind spot. So it was an epistemic blind spot before she saw red, then she saw red and it's not. So it's available, it's a physical fact that's available to be, to play that um, counter example role against the revised knowledge argument. It's available to say, no, it's, it's not obvious that T3, T3 is not true. It's not obvious that no, no fact could um, play, physical fact could um, be what Mary learns when she leaves the room. So the revised knowledge argument is false. So what's the connection to, uh, to machine consciousness? Well, it goes by via this um, connection that we might've found here between consciousness and self-reference. One can ask, look, is RM this weird proposition, P and if Mary has not seen red, then Mary does not know RM. Does, is it really a plausible candidate for what Mary comes to know when she experiences seeing red for the first time? My first response is to say it doesn't matter, at, at least as far as the uh, revised knowledge argument is concerned. All I had to do is find one counterexample, and that shows that Jackson's argument doesn't work. But I don't want to be so austere here. I want to actually try to find some deeper connections. So let's let's actually take this question a little seriously and say, well, what's the problem with RM? Some might be put off by what they perceive to be its contrived nature. It's a bit recherche. Uh, you know, is this some kind of linguistic trick? is uh, could knowledge of such a, a, a recursively self-referential conditional epistemic blind spot really have any substantial connection to what it's like to experience red? Well, I think we have some indications that despite maybe appear first appearances, that actually the answer to that question is, is yes. 
So, you know, there are several theories that try to, that do, you know, forge a connection between not just like higher order thought, but actually self-referential, self uh, self-representational uh, abilities and uh, consciousness. And I'm not just thinking of uh, Uriah Kriegel and company here, but also Douglas Hofstetter's I Am a Strange Loop, I think makes this point very explicitly. Maybe you could understand something of what Graziano is doing is, is, is uh, involving some uh, self-reference in a very important way in uh, the nature of consciousness. But more particularly, the, in the, the, the particular kind of uh, vir virtual machine functionalist account of qualia that Aaron Sloman and I have worked on um, independently of this argument, by the way. So we started work on that, uh, we call it VMF. You can call it the VMF account of qualia. We started on that back in like 2001. Uh, and I only came up with this argument uh, about uh, Jackson a few years ago. So um, it's, it's definitely an independently motivated theory. What is that theory? So I can explain how it um, motivates RM. Well, it's a physicalist theory of qualia. It says, look, uh, you know, Kevin's right. We have lots of beliefs about qualia and many of them are false, but it denies, unlike what uh, say some people like Kevin and maybe Daniel Dennett would say, that doesn't mean that because we have these so many false theories about qualia that, that those uh, so false beliefs about qualia that therefore um, qualia don't exist. For example, um, the ancients had lots of false beliefs about gold, but um, we didn't conclude that gold exists. We just concluded that they had a bad theory of gold um, and gold, um, if, if because we found something that um, explains our, uh, our and, the, and our, the ancients talk about uh, gold uh, in, a, in a unified way. We considered gold to um, have been, uh, we've, we found a referent for gold, even though that referent of gold didn't meet and maybe couldn't meet any of the things that, um, or most of the things that the ancients believed about gold, like it was made, it was a compound and it was made of uh, alchemical essences and things like this. Um, so if that picture's right, then to look for physical, physicalist qualia, we should be looking for the virtual machine aspects of ourselves that explain why we tend to have the beliefs that we have about quality, qualia, especially the false beliefs about qualia. So why, what is it about, if, you know, if there's something in our virtual machine architecture that is, that is responsible for our talk about qualia, qualia that causes us to believe in qualia um, and causes us to believe false things about qualia. For instance, uh, that the belief that they are non-physical or that they are unknowable by others or that they're uh, private or um, uh, ineffable. Then uh, if we can explain, if we can use those states to explain why we have those false beliefs about it, then I think we would have found the referent of qualia and not eliminated qualia. Just like we didn't eliminate gold when we found the stuff that explained why people believed that it was a compound of a certain kind or why it was made of a certain um, alchemical essence, a combination of alchemical essences. So as an aside, there are some strange consequences of this view. Um, whether such aspects, that is the aspects of us, of our virtual machine architecture say that explain our talk, thought and beliefs about qualia, whether they constitute a unifiable thing as they did in the case of gold um, and can thus serve as a referent for qualia, that's an empirical question. So I think we're the only people who think that whether or not there are qualia is an empirical issue. Um, people on one side say it's or an open empirical question. I guess maybe Dennett thinks it's, uh, well, anyway, I, I think most people who, who think that it's incompatible with physicalism think that it's a priori incompatible with physicalism. It's just not the kind, you can look at that philosophically and conclude from your armchair that nothing physical could satisfy those conditions. And then the other people think that you can tell from your armchair that they are possible, for instance, just by introspection. Um, and uh, we're, I, we're in this strange position of saying that it's actually an empirical issue, whether or not there is a reference for, for qualia. Um, so it's an open empirical question whether qualia, the, qual, the term qualia is like the term gold or whether it's like the term phlogiston. And here's another twist. 
even if we don't have a unifiable aspect in our virtual machine architecture that explains our qualia talk, our qualia beliefs, our qualia um, thoughts, we could in principle, I guess, build an artificial system that by design does have, it's just like us in other ways, or every other way perhaps, but it does have a unified explanation for those properties. That's logically possible, I guess. And in such a case, that artificial system would have qualia, even though we don't. So that's a, a really weird um, empirical possibility. But um, to, to just a last slide, the um, virtual machine functionalist account of qualia and self-reference, well, how, how do they relate? Well, it follows from our virtual machine functionalist account of qualia. I can't go into the details why, but I hope I've given you some of uh, enough of a flavor that you could imagine that this is true. It's, it follows from our account that when an agent with a virtual machine architecture that supports the existence of qualia sees red for the first time, that agent um, acquires, possibly in addition to some non-self-referential beliefs, the self-referential belief that A itself has knowledge K now that A could not have had before seeing red for the first time. And such a belief can be proved by A to be true as was done uh, you know, after it's seen red, as was done before when we were refuting the revised knowledge argument. So it's a kind of meta-knowledge. And- um, Okay, my microphone just crashed. Can you hear me? Some, can, can you hear me now? I okay, hear you so much we, better now. My AirPod, oh, is it better now? My AirPods microphone just died. So, okay, I'm, I'm, now you have a better microphone. Uh, so last, last, sent, last point. Um, the fact that this account of qualia constructed over multiple decades independently, is it completely, uh, yeah, independently of these considerations, the fact that it finds a role for the kinds of knowledge that I have independently shown to refute the revised knowledge argument, I think motivates and increases the plausibility of this weird proposition, RM, uh, being the kind of knowledge which might be gained when a subject like Mary, not necessarily when we do, but when a subject like Mary experiences seeing red for the first time. So thanks a lot for sticking it out and uh, I look forward to our, our discussion. Thank you so much, Ron. Uh, do we have a question from Libby? Yeah, sorry if I if I've kind of if you've already gone over this as the argument progressed, but it sounds like um, these epistemic blind spots are potentially what's missing from a deductive account of knowledge. So this set of the set of all sets of facts that you could obtain. So um, is how would we say no as an observer of virtual machines, um, whether they had that kind of, the, the, whether they had those, how we could deductively uh, see whether or not they had the same epistemic blind spots, if that makes sense. Well, uh, there's a there are two answers to your question. Um, understanding your question and to, or focusing on two different parts of your question. So I think actually determining whether a proposition is an epistemic blind spot for someone or not is relatively non-empirical. You just have to look to see whether it makes reference to the knowledge of the person in question, Mary in our case. Uh, in such a way as to make it impossible for, logically impossible for Mary to know that. Now, maybe maybe that's actually, maybe being, I'm being naive and there might be epistemic propositions which turn out to be epistemic blind spots, but we can't tell unless we do a lot of uh, deductive theorem proving or something. So yeah, maybe that's a possibility. But, um, but the, the thing that you're, that's more interesting, I think about your question is that yeah, now, now the, the real empirical, empirically interesting or technologically interesting question about machine consciousness would be, how do we build agents that are capable of having beliefs at all? And how do we uh, build agents that are capable of having beliefs about their own inner states? And those are difficult questions, uh, but they're not at all the kinds of philosophically austere and intractable questions that have been raised about um, machines being conscious, right? So I'm not trying to say that 
if you think of it this way, there are easy questions of consciousness and the hard, the hard problem of the hard problem of consciousness and easy problems of consciousness. And Chalmers and so many other people just said, okay, easy problems. Yeah, no, no philosophical objection to that. What we have a problem with is this uh, hard question, but I think that gets it backwards. I think um, the hard qu problem is, is rather easily resolved um, in, in in, in but in ways that I can't go into now, but having to do with um, this physicalist account of qualia and what becomes difficult are the things that Chalmers said was easy, which is getting, how do we build a system that has beliefs in the first place? Um, so I don't think those are hard in the sense of philosophically impossible, like he was asking, but I think they're, they're challenges that um, we can actually make uh, progress on. I have a, thank you. I have a, a question too. So uh, from my perspective, it seems that Mary is not uh, identical to her brain or neural implementation, but uh, Mary is a model of a person uh, and it's a multimodal model of a person. And uh, her uh, knowledge that she self ascribes is a model of what she has models of, right? And this uh, concerns different modalities. So for instance, she has propositional knowledge and she has an implementation of a game engine that produces the simulation of the world that she subjectively inhabits. And so when we ask ourselves whether uh, Mary is able to uh, learn something new about red, when she sees red for the first time, uh, I think it comes down to the question of uh, whether Mary is able to change the implementation of a mental game engine uh, solely by the uh, access to propositional knowledge. Right, reading about what red is in books. The uh, color itself is a local feature dimension of texture. Mm -hmm. And the redness is a basis vector of a certain color space. The uh, redness is not part of the perceptual pattern itself, but it's interpreted in the context of a hierarchical perceptual representation of objects. It's a property that is shared by all red objects, right? But it's, a, it's the way in which texture varies locally. And uh, it's, if we abstract from the human brain implementation, maybe there is a limitation in what Mary can do with her particular human brain uh, because the way she's born, because there was never a reason in evolutionary history for uh, somebody like Mary to access uh, via a propositional knowledge how a low level perception is done. Or maybe there is a limit to neuroplasticity and she only can do this in the first six months of her life. And after that, her color dimensions are baked and she's not going to learn any new ones, right? That's all possible, but let's abstract from this. We, uh, I think it might come down to the question of whether a large language model in AI is able to acquire a model of surface properties of 3D objects that is isomorphic to a model that it would acquire from compressing video adequately, right? So there are diff different possibilities to answer this. We could say that no objects in Mary's world, if Mary is a large language model, can be distinguished by uh, injecting color at the level of texture. Right? So if Mary is some kind of robot that is not able to uh, have color sensors in the world, then she cannot tell objects away by color. So the color representation would be merged at the conceptual level, not at the perceptual level of the representation. And uh, yes would be if Mary takes uh, to study all the associations between colors and sufficiently large numbers of objects. So basically if you give her a labeled data set and labeled data set, there are all sorts of red objects and non-red objects and red textures and non-red textures and uh, red gradients and non-red gradients and so on. Eventually she, uh, the best uh, level of representation the, uh, of these associations, uh, the embedding layer will not be at the conceptual level. Uh, it's not clear to me whether we uh, will get it below the texture, right? So this is where it would need to be. be. So we now we have a very, very concrete way of talking about the entire Mary discussion that is much more concrete than what philosophers usually do. Do you think it's adequate? I think um, that, yeah, I would welcome that, that uh, not for the Mary question necessarily, but I would welcome that advance in our understanding of how we have knowledge about colors and our own experiences of colors. That would be a great advance. Um, and so maybe you're contributing to that. Uh, what I don't think is that um, it would help give a response to, as far as I can tell, give a response to Jackson uh, without more, without one, I didn't need to hear more about how it could um, either uh, 
defend Jackson against my critique, or it could um, instead provide a different way to attack his argument. Because um, whatever you call, whatever new ways you have of understanding what our knowledge consists in, Jackson is going to want, is going to, you know, say either, um, well, he's, go he's going to insist that, you know, if it really is, uh, if there are configurations that Mary can be in uh, afterwards, physical configurations that she could be in afterwards um, that constitute knowledge of what it's like to see red, then he's already supposing that she is in those configurations before she leaves the room and that she was able to do so just by, um, by reading or what, whatever, whatever it is, but, but in, in particular without actually having seen red. And so um, he, I don't, he's not going to yeah, I don't think it doesn't. You, you're if if you have a response to him, it doesn't have the the advantage. I think, if if I may say so, the advantage of having this kind of logical uh, objection to him that I, I'm able to, you know, rule out his argument as being impossible um, through uh, a logical demonstration rather than a speculation about what future details we might discover about Mary's uh, ability to know about the details of this uh, um, uh, uh, way of level, you know, the level to which we can know the details of our visual system. I, I, it shouldn't, I don't think it's the kind of problem that should depend on that um, kind of issue. It seems to me that this would split this into two problems. One would be that we would need to come to some kind of shared agreement of a possible interpretation of the problem that is, uh, uh, Mary is a particular kind of cognitive agent that has a particular kind of architecture. So basically, we can understand Mary as a machine learning problem and uh, of a very particular nature. And then uh, this second point would be that it now comes down to an uh, empirical question that can also be possibly answered analytically by talking about this uh, empirical problem of whether it's possible to uh, get uh, to an equivalence between propositional knowledge and uh, the tacit knowledge that Mary would have when she interacts with the world. By the way, uh, so we have uh, one more question about this. Uh, who has risen their hand? It's Nathan. And then uh, after Nathan, I would like to open up uh, the larger panel discussion. Hi, um, just have uh, two thoughts. One, one is, um, it seems like it's, the, the idea there is built on the assumption that no, knowledge has to be true and not self-contradictory. So, uh, if, if knowledge does not have to be true uh, or self-contradictory, then you could you then Mary could have knowledge of B. And then also it seems like this is built on the idea that you know a, a, a person could be implemented with an infinite amount of knowledge. Um, and both of those seem like they probably false. Any thoughts on I, that? I, I, I agree uh, on both with both of those points. Um, but I don't think uh, it uh, takes away from uh, the point I was making. So you're right, an assumption is being made by Jackson that knowledge is true. He talks about physical information most of the time, actually not, not knowledge, but um, he means it. He means he's talking about true facts when he talks about information and when he talks, so that's why, that's why we can help ourselves to the notion of what Mary knows, because it's called the knowledge argument. And Jackson does mean true beliefs that are for which one has some kind of justification in believing them. He doesn't mean just beliefs that may or may not be true. So um, I'm, I'm entitled to use it in refuting him because he's using it in order to make the argument. So I'm using his same materials. The second point uh, was about, uh, could you remind me? Um about the a finite um, amount of uh, knowledge. Right, so I think that's a plus about my argument is that I show that I agree that there are problems with, his, with, with Jackson's argument, but when he starts talking about someone knowing all physical, <laughs> physical facts, like that's just a crazy, crazily infinite number. It's not, it's not probably not just uh, 
countably infinite is probably uncountably infinite number of facts, if that makes any sense. Um, and so a lot of people have objected to his argument on those grounds. Um, but he's, he still thinks, well, just suppose it's, you know, it, 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 there are ways to try and limit this. Say, okay, I'm only going to talk about the, the facts that are really relevant to uh, seeing color. But even then, I think there are an infinite number of facts. The, the advantage of my argument, it just says, okay, suppose it, you can know an infinite number of facts. Even God can't know. Well, I, can't, I shouldn't say even God, because uh, God might be, you know, as soon as you talk about God, you may be talking about a non-physical being. And so maybe the facts about his knowledge are non-physical facts. But um, um, there's no being, no possible physical being that can know an epistemic blind spot, even if it's infinite, even if it's an infinite physical being, if that's possible, you know, even if that were physically possible, that there could be an infinite physical being, it still can't know an epistemic blind spot. So my argument just avoids that debate about finitude and infinitude and just says, yeah, let him have that um, infinity. He still can't get his argument to work because infinity won't allow you to escape logical impossibility. I guess my, my, my main comment is like, yeah, yes, it debunks that, but, um, but I think that it might invalidate the self-referential claim that it might apply to other stuff. Oh, hmm. Uh, well, the self-referential claim isn't itself infinitistic. It's, um, uh, I'm not sure if I see why I should be worried by the fact that minds are finite. Um, uh, well, mostly the, 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 the contradictory knowledge, right? So, so if uh, the, the, the epistemic blind spot is, uh, assumes that uh, the knowledge is true. And yeah, so if in consciousness, that doesn't necessarily apply. No, so I believe we can have contradictory beliefs. So we just might be using the terms differently. So I think Mary might believe two things that are in fact contradictory. Um, and we, we might believe things that are in fact contradictory. Um, I probably have <laughs> probably been inconsistent today several times. Um, but uh, I don't think that affects the knowledge argument. So the knowledge argument is just focusing on what um, knowledge Mary does have in the set in Jackson's sense, that is true beliefs that are justified, that she's justified in believing. So I don't think, um, yeah, I think I can, my, I can still have, have a picture that, that handles all the, all the facts you want to handle about how people can be inconsistent and, and make mistakes and, and have beliefs that are, Inconsistent, yeah. 